And this is famously enacted in the proclamation of Queen Victoria. And what are the, you've read the proclamation of Queen Victoria. It's a key document because it makes certain promises to the Indian people about the new nature of rule that will exist um, under uh, 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 direct British rule. Anyone have a, have a memory of what's in the proclamation, of what one of these promises are? Yeah. What's your name? Nicole. Nicole. Right. Right. Well, the key thing is that there's an insistence that there won't be religious um, 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 attempt to convert people away from their religious principles. That, that you know, because a big part of the of the uh, 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 of the work of the East India companies had gone around mission uh, had been around the sort of missionary impulse to try and try and. Um, Christianise the Indian people. So that, that's a, a promise that there'll be no attempt at Christianisation. Yeah. Um, excuse me. Didn't she promise no more expansion into Italy? Yeah. And then she also said that she apologised for like the past ambitious individuals who like came over and did wrong. So. Right. So th there's a, a there's a, a, a vow not to engage in further <laughs> territorial expansion, which of course always came at the expense. I mean, you know, came from funds collected by taxation in India itself. Anything else? Yeah. Um, are you asking me whether Queen Victoria could write? No. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a government, it's, you know, it's a government, um, uh, the, go the, the, the government would have, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure she would have vetted and, you know, and, and maybe her advisors would have changed some of the, of the language, but this is basically a government document. Yeah? Um, one of the things that was picture that I read is that she uh, promised, like, all equal access to the public service. Right, okay, great. Great, and we'll stop there because I don't have enough time to go through all. Critically, she promised that government posts would be open to <coughs> Indian subjects. Okay? And she also promised that all subjects of India would be equal in the eyes of the law. That is to say that if you're a subject of hers in India, you're basically subject to the same laws as, as those subjects in, in, in Britain. Because remember, Trevelyan had set up the civil service, it was a high prestige thing, and Indians wanted to have um, a slice um, of it. So, a whole set of, um, a, a, of, of important promises to the Indian people, okay, uh, straight away. Then, of course, a very determined use of repression, where you see in this stunningly horrible image um, of how um, the leaders of the rebellion were, were um, killed by having um, cannon cannon cannons um, fired through them. I mean, a dreadful um, form of execution designed to have the maximum symbolic effect of deterrence. Um, so, very, very harsh treatment of the leaders, um, a, a, an amnesty for those not charged with offences of murdering um, uh, British um, <coughs> subjects. A, importantly, a rebuilding of the army, and a rebuilding of the army in the Punjab particularly. Okay? Very important, the Pun Punjabis, remained basically, was seen to be the, one of the most loyal regions of the country during the uh, revolt, and an enormous amount of investment and infrastructure goes into rebuilding the Punjab and building the loyalties of those um, uh, uh, people. And then there is a process which is again foreshadowed in a proclamation of an enormous investment in the infrastructure of um, uh, of India. The use of the massive expansion of the railway system, um, uh, the uh, uh, use of, 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 of the telegraph and of uh, uh, postal technologies, all of which clearly made India much, much more governable for the British. Okay? It, all critical technologies of transport and communication that allow Britain to move its troops 
around the country and to know where and when troops were needed. In 1863, there were 2,500 miles of railway track in India. Um, by 1920, there's 32,000 miles of radio network. A massive expansion. And unlike the constructions of railways in Britain, which is done by private capital, this is a state-sponsored project. Okay? Um, the other key part of infrastructure that they do is the development of irrigation systems um, uh, to improve the productivity of the land, um, uh, to produce more food, and of course to yield more taxation. Um, finally, what happens is a codification of these racial distinctions that, in, uh, that Britain would then govern India through. Um, and this happens in a number of ways. It happens through the valorization of certain castes and race as being um, at more martial and more military. Um, and the Sikhs are the great example of the most valorized martial of all races in India. It also happens through the institution of the census, first introduced in 1876, I think, but the first big census happens in 1881, and it minutely records and therefore codifies uh, distinctions of caste. Okay? Now, some historians even argue that caste, um, that caste distinctions, which of course had been around for a long time, became newly enshrined in Indian society as a consequence of this type of, um, uh, of, this type of work. That now certain castes could make claims to, 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 um, to state power and to state funds because of their um, uh, codification within the, um, the census um, uh, 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 system. So the, the state, if you like, has a new sort of ethnographic gaze, a new ethnographic concern with the very nature of Indian society, believing that the better it knows Indian society, the better it can effectively rule it. Now, very obviously, if we look forward a little bit, what this does is not buy the loyalty of the Indian people. I'll give you one example of the failed uh, promise, and there are going to be several more in lectures to, to come. The big promise of being allowed to enter the Indian um, civil service, by 1887, only a dozen Indians... Um, were serving in that service. One of the, one of the great um, uh, inconvenient truths of the great promise to allow Indians to join the civil service was that they had to go to London to take their entry exams, which was obviously you know, beyond um, uh, 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 the means of most. Um, and you have the foundation of the Indian National Congress in um, 1885. And I'll tell you a lot more um, about that story in a later lecture. Any questions about the revolt um, in India? <coughs> right. Let me then provide my last words. For some of you get to Thursday at this point and you just think, how am I going to get through the weekend until Tuesday? without listening to this man talk. Do you th and then, and then, but it's so nice to know that you've got the podcast that you can go to, you know, so you can do a bit of listening to me while you jog. And it's just like, I can, I can be with you all the time. Um, I'm not really that conceited. You know, there, there's, there is a thing called irony in Britain, which um, uh, is something that is very great. Um, so a conclusion. Uh, so, first thing I want you to get is that Britain was not a stable and peaceable kingdom. Okay? There was a really decisive challenge to the new liberal settlement in Britain throughout the Chartist period. But, and and, and, and uh, that was true in 1842 and it was true in um, 1840. 
48. That second point that you need to make is that, that, that I need to make, the second point that I need to make is that this difficult process of having to, to remake authority and to be able to stretch it over more and more people as they're more mobile and are, are living further and further apart um, was an immensely difficult one. That was not, uh, there, there was no quick and easy fix for. And partly as a consequence of that, you have the continuing use of the repressive apparatus of the state. Okay, you see that very, very clearly in the policing and the treatment of <coughs> Chartism in the 1830s and 1840s. And, of course, you see it very horrifically in the um, uh, 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 treatment of um, uh, the revolt um, in India. And the last point that I want to make is one that I hope is apparent to you, which is that there was no way that you were going to see Fergus O'Connor standing in front of a cannon about to have his heart blown out. Okay? There was no way that that type of exemplary repressive violence would have been possible in Britain. It was just politically not possible. Okay? So there is a huge difference in what it is possible for the British government to do in India and what it was possible to do in Britain itself. Now, very quickly, a few words about what you have to look forward to over the weekend. Because next week, basically, what I want to do is continue looking at this process of how authority and power was remade. And I'm going to... To, to show you, basically give you two lectures. One which is about the reform of the political system, um, which is going to be very much about what is the nature of this new liberal representative system, and which we already know excludes most working uh, people. How is it projected as being um, a fully reformed and representative um, system? Who's left out of it? Who's bought into it? And I'm also going to look at the development of a new type of state in Britain, which I'm going to argue was characteristic of a completely new and modern form of state power, one that basically we continue um, to, um, to, to live um, under. Um, so you have that to look forward to. Um, we have nine minutes to go, but don't worry, I have no intention of keeping you here or even asking if you have a question, unless someone is desperate to ask me a question. This is the point where there is someone in this room who is desperate to ask me a question, but they're so worried that the rest of you will hate them forever <laughs> that they're not going to ask that question. So please come and talk to me after the class if you do have that burning question. And have a great weekend. <laughs>